And so it's my pleasure to introduce Raphael Kulik to talk about block estimators in extreme value theory. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you to the Institute for the support. And uh, it's nice for me to be here after 15 years and see familiar faces. Okay, so this is based on my joint work for the last couple of years with Philippe Soulier, my, my, my good friend from, from France, and then Yusuf Sisoko, PhD student, and then Zawi Chen, uh, postdoc at this moment with me in Ottawa. Uh, so the idea of this talk is that uh, I wasn't sure exactly about the audience, so I'll start relatively very, very mild. So for those of you who are in probability and statistics, I mean, I apologize for the low level of, of, of uh, theoretical details. Uh, then I will kind of, uh, in this second part, uh, I will go to more specific problems that we have worked in the last few years. And then a couple of other things, uh, what's going on right now. And then I will finish probably for a couple of minutes, I will talk about what's next with extended value theory, okay? One thing that, uh, that I would try to, one message that I would like to kind of convey here is that uh, as opposed to what is the current fashion about big data, extended value theory is about small data, okay? So it's completely opposed to, to what's, what's going on right now. And second is that I, I believe extended value theory is one of the subjects in probability and statistics that you really need to use a lot of machinery from, from pure the theoretical mathematics. And I will explain why, okay? Okay, so let me start very, very elementary. For, again, for, for, for people from probability and statistics, please forgive me. So the classical central limit theorem is, well, this is well, what is this about? So we, we have independent random variables. Uh, identically distributed, they have the mean, they have the variance. When you take the sum, okay. When you take the sum, when you scale the sum appropriately, you have convergence in appropriate way to, to normal distribution, okay? So everybody knows it in probability and statistics, even, even the students in the first year, but at, at least they should, okay? Anyway, there are a lot of extensions. There are multivert extensions. You can you can uh, you can consider different dependent structures. So this has been the field for I, I would say about hundred years. Okay. So the message is the main message that we try to kind of teach students in, in probability and statistics in the very first uh, courses is that normal distribution plays a central role okay, in in probability and statistics, and I, I underlined the central. For, for specific reason, because normal distribution takes care of what happens in the middle portion of the distribution. So all of the central limit theorems, everything that we use, I mean, let's say 90% of the stuff that we use in statistics is about central tendencies, what happens on average, okay? Now, extra value theory is kind of completely different thing. Uh, and extra value theory deals with rare events, okay? So something that happens very, very, I mean, not very often, okay? And there is particular consequence of this. And as I mentioned, at this moment, there is this, this trend of dealing with big data, huge data, all of these fancy words, and extra value theory is precisely about something different. This is about small data, okay? And there are challenges because of small data. And well, why, why small data? Because we are interested in extremes, okay? About, about extremal behavior. It could be very small values. It could be very large values uh, in different sense. And so what we want to learn about extremes is, well, how they occur, when do they occur, and what is all of magnitude, okay? And a couple of typical applications uh, in, in finance, Every bank, every financial industry, uh, at least in North America, and especially in Europe, I'm not sure about, uh, about, about Australia, they have to maintain particular particular level of, of cash on hand, and this is calculated using risk measures, okay? So this is related to extreme external losses from, from, from different investments. Uh, another big thing, which is actually, I would say, one of the most important applications of, of extended theory is insurance, okay? And this is, there are 
basically two types of insurance. Life insurance, which has nothing really to do with, with extreme value theory. You have a lot of data. Uh, all, all of the losses are well well defined. Okay, you have your life insurance for five hundred thousand dollars. Let's say this is the maximum loss that the company can 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 can, can have. And for company five hundred thousand is nothing. Okay, what is really crucial and really unpredictable are the large claims coming from fires, coming from floods, and very likely in, in Australia, you will have a discussion very, very soon about what to do with flood insurance, because these things are very unpredictable. It's extremely hard to, 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 to estimate anything. So either, so what, what the insurance companies do, at least in, in, in Canada, either they don't insure for such, such, such losses like flood or, or, or fires, or they put, Hard threshold. We don't. We don't. We don't uh, insure over particular particular level. Okay. And the reason for this is that this is extremely hard to 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 do any estimation, any statistics. And extreme value theory really comes comes come, comes here. And then the last item, which is kind of the fashion at this moment, this is the weather and climate. Okay. So prediction of. Uh, Fires, water, floods, and, and climate climate development. Okay, so a lot of a lot of development is motivated by by practical applications. If you want to do some practical applications, okay. Now, in this case, normal di distribution is not not of a particular use. Well, it is not useful at all. Okay, and what is the reason? So this is the kind of classical times a classical data, this is called uh, Danish fire, fire reinsurance data. Uh, if you use R, this is, this is built in, in, in the software. So you have a time and you have claims, okay? And what you see, you have a lot of dark, dark matter here, okay? It means that the, that the claims are very, very, very small. So, I mean, the companies do not care about such claims. What is really a problem are these big peaks here, okay? I'm not sure how, if my pointer is visible, but you have one claim on the top about 250, and then a couple of claims in the other parts of the picture, okay? So if I'm interested, if I want to estimate what is the probability that the claim will be above, let's say 20, okay? So what do I do? I put the blue line, I count how many observations are above blue line, divide by the number of observations, and this works beautifully, okay? It's really, you have a lot of data, all, 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 everything works, you have all of the possible limit theorems, confidence intervals, hypothesis testing, whatever you want. Then if I, let's say, if my threshold is, uh, for, let's say 30, okay, about, about 30, so again, I, I, I can still count how many observations are above the red line, there are much, much less, but still decent amount of, 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 of values, and I can construct an empirical estimate. However, if my question is, what is the probability that I exceed 100, so the green line, well, I have three observations, and you cannot really do any statistics with this, okay? Okay, you can do, but it's not particularly meaningful, okay? So the, the, the extreme value theory is, is precisely about how to get the information about this extremal portion, okay? So what you really need to do, and I will try to, to kind of convey this message through, through my talk, is that you have to use some information from the middle portion, from this, you know, what happens between, let's say, red and, 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 and the green, and use some statistical model to, to extrapolate. This is the, 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 the main idea of extreme value. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Excuse me. Okay. So let me just go through very basic limit theorems in extreme value theory. And again, for for probab probably statisticians, I apologize for, for, for the low, low level. Okay, so we have a sequence of non-negative random variables. They are independent. They have the tail distribution function which is actually the object that you want to look at in, in extreme value theory. And then, well, this is a very easy calculation. Uh, when I look at the 
maximum, what is probability of the maximum is smaller, then, okay, if this is because of independence, you have a product measure, you get the power n, and this, but the, the thing is that this goes to zero, okay? So the limiting distribution is degenerate here, okay? So if you just do this calculation, you don't get any, really any, any, any information. So what you need to do, you need to add a normalization to, 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 to extremes. In other words, what happens here is that if you have n observations, at some point the maxima become too big, okay? So you need to make them smaller, so you need to kind of standardize everything. Okay, so let me show how you standardize. And I'll show you two examples that basically summarize the extreme value theory for univari univariate random variables. So I have exponential distribution. So the tail distribution is exponent minus lambda of lambda x. And then there is kind of very easy calculation. What is most important thing here is that you add this centering. Okay, it's not, okay, not centering, but you add, you subtract log n, okay? So the extremes are too big, so you make them smaller by subtracting something, okay? And then you do easy calculation. Again, you have independence, everything becomes the product measure and very simple, simple convergence. You get, uh, you get, uh, sorry, it should be exponent, exponent minus lambda x, okay? So we complain about students and we still, we, we, do, we, we do mistakes, okay? Anyway, so we have one possible, possible limit. Again, that it should be here, exponent, exponent minus lambda x. I apologize for, for the mistake. So this is one situation. Another situation is the case of what I will really focus on today. And this is really what, what the, for example, insurance companies are, are worried about, about heavy tail distributions. The basic example of a heavy tail distribution is so-called Pareto distribution, okay? So what happens here, you have the tail like x to the power minus alpha. So the tail decays much, much slower than exponential tail practically means that you have a bigger chance of having big values, okay? This is the meaning of heavy tails. And when you do the same calculation, and, and every, you have a product measure and you have the convergence to, to something different, okay? So these are two basic, very simple examples, but in, in a sense, they, they, they give you the only possible limits for, for limiting distribution of maximum, okay? So, uh, okay, there are okay, three possible limits, but the, the third limit is for, for, for bounded random variables, which, which I'm not quite interested in. Okay? So two very simple, simple examples, but they kind of summarize what you can expect uh, in, in terms of limit theorems. So that is a kind of mega theorem that, I mean, dates back to 100 years ago. Uh, if you have a sequence of independent random variables and uh, there are some mild conditions what, how they should behave, uh, then there exists constants, there is constant sequence a n that typically goes to infinity, there is sequence b n that also typically goes to infinity, but they could be also zero. And so there exist sequences such that if you look at the, at the limiting distribution of the maxima, you get a proper limit. And there are two possible limits. One limit is now it's correctly written. This is the double exponential. And then another one is which is called pressure, okay? So the first limit corresponds, which is called Gumbel, corresponds to light tails. So when you start start with exponential random variables, normal random variables, a viable and whatever, so whatever, all of the light tails, you end up in, 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 in Gumbel distribution. And when you start with, with, with uh, heavy tailed uh, random variables, like Pareto, like T student distribution, you end up with pressure limit, okay? With pressure limit, and this is what, what, what uh, I'm primarily interested in, with a pressure limit, you have this parameter alpha, which is called tail index, uh, in the context of T distribution, this is just the number of degrees of freedom, okay? Uh, so the tail index is, is, is of interest in, for, for, for if, if you know the tail index, you can calculate a lot of univariate quantities. Okay, so this is the basic 
limit theorem in, in extreme value the in extreme value theory. One thing, thing that I want to point out is this connection to regular variation. There is a beautiful piece of mathematics related to regular varying functions. Uh, there's connection to, to fractals, connection to many, many other fields that, that and so it's very, very nice part of, of mathematics. Okay, now what happens under dependence? Okay, so first again, I, I write things for for independent random variables. So I basically recall what I wrote before. If I start with independent random variables, if they are heavy tailed, more specifically regularly varying, I end up with this limit. Okay. Now, if I and this is very easy to, 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 to get this limit. However, when you get dependence, okay, things change significantly. Uh, any limit theorem in statistics that involves dependence is often very hard to, 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 to establish. For, for, let's say for central limit theorems, there's a lot of techniques nowadays uh, and you can, that you can play with. For extremes, this is much, much, much harder, okay? And the first thing is that, well, you cannot write this as the product measure, the, the, the first one. But, there the, is kind of general statement, which is not very, very old, I would say, it's about, about, okay, about 40 years ago, uh, that if you have a sequence, which is stationary, so there is like invariance in the law, and I add this regular, regular, regular variation, so there is some structure, okay? I don't want to go into too many details what regular variation is in the context of multivariate distributions, but you need some structure, okay? So if you have a stationarity, so shift in variance, if you have some structure, then the, the limit is almost the same, but there is this parameter, which is called extremal index, okay? And this parameter is very, very important because it, it, it shows up in all of the calculations that, that, that you are going to make for extremes, okay? I will talk a little bit in a moment about this parameter, but first of all, this parameter is between zero and one. It, it indicates the, the level of clustering, okay? And so let me talk a little bit about this parameter. So as I mentioned, it indicates the amount of clustering, the smaller theta, the more clustering of extremes. I will, I will show a picture. It is possible that theta is equal to zero when the limit on the previous slide is degenerate, okay? And this is, for example, the situation uh, for those of you who do some Monte Carlo methods, when you have rejection methods or metropolitan casting algorithm, these type of things, when you start with a heavy tail distribution, so when you kind of, uh, you, 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 you reject or you accept, and then, so if you start with a heavy tail distribution, you will tend to reject the new proposal for a long, long, long time. So if you start with a heavy tail distribution, the, you will not, you, you, it will take you quite a while to get any decent sample from your target distribution, okay? And precisely the, the, this, this rejection method has extrema index zero, okay? So this is the meaning of, 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 of large, large cluster. So you will have this, basically this, in, in this context of rejection method, you will tend to reject for a long, 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 long time. Okay, uh, and so in, in, in the context of extremes, this is, this is uh, related to long, long range dependence, not in the sense of correlations in completely different sense. Okay? Uh, of course, theta equal to one uh, corresponds to independence, to no clustering. And roughly speaking, so theta is the reciprocal of the mean cluster size, okay? And I will show you one example in a moment. What does it mean? Uh, it will be shown on the picture. Now, these two parameters, K index and extremal index are of primary concern. Okay? This is what you want to get from, from your data. And I mentioned that this is not an easy task. Why, why not easy task? Because first, they appear in the limit. They appear as the exponent in the limit. Estimating exponent is always very, very hard. Okay. For example, Hurst, uh, Hurst uh, parameter in, in terms of fractals, it is extremely hard to estimate. Second, you have the issue of small data. This, these parameters like tail index or extremal index, they are related to extremes. Okay. 
So they should come from some from large values, and you don't have enough large values. Okay, so you have to do some tricks. So, and I, I, I again I emphasize this many many times. In order to do some proper estimation, you need you need to have a model structure. Okay. And there are multivariate extensions for, 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 for these basic limit theorems. There are additional things that, that show, show, show up, but I will not go into, into so many details at this moment. Okay? So the message, we have two parameters. There are many other parameters that we may be interested in. These parameters are very hard to estimate, so we need to do some, some tricks. Okay? But let me show one example to understand what is this external index. The example is very simple. I have a sequence of independent uh, student random variables, so very heavy tail with parameter one. So this is, this is the number of degrees of freedom. And because, because of independence, external index is one. Okay, now I define this sequence. It's very simple. What happens here? If you have large value, this value will be repeated. Okay, so you can calculate, you can calculate <coughs> so theoretically, that this new sequence has extremal index one over two. Why one over two? Because the, the large values come in pairs. Okay. So basically, how big is your cluster of large values comes in the in the denominator. Okay. So on the picture, this looks like like here. So on the left hand side, this is the sample from independent student random mm -hmm. variables. So you have a lot of you know. Red matter and then a couple of big values that come with without any clustering, and then this is the sample from this time series model. So you can see a bunch of these eyes. Okay, so it means you have large value followed immediately by 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 a large value. Okay, so this amount of clustering shows up in the extremal index. Of course, this is the toy example, and the situation data is much much more evolved. But this I wanted just to show this. What is the meaning of this extremal index? Okay, so basically, to get to get the, an estimate or empirical estimate of this extremal index, you would count how many eyes you have above large threshold. But again, the problem is that you don't have too many eyes okay, above above large threshold. Okay, so how do, how uh, so okay? The, the basic problems are estimation of parameter alpha. Estimation of extremal index. Uh, alpha is the univariate parameter, so there are univariate methods. Theta, the extremal index, is an infinite dimensional parameter in some sense because it depends on the entire time series. Okay, it's not even the multivariate. It doesn't stem from the multivariate behavior. It stems from the entire sequence. Okay. So there are spe special approaches that, that you have to make. So I will start with. So called block maxima method. This is not what I do, but just to point out what the problems are. And then I, I will go to, to our method, point out connections to, to, I think, very beautiful mathematics. And then I will go to recent problems in extreme value theory. Okay, so what is the block maxima method? So, what, what you do when you have rare events? What, what you do when you have something, some quantities, functions, parameters that depend on the entire sequence? So you take, you, you have your data of size n, okay? And then you pick block size Rn. It has to go to infinity, slower than the block size, okay? And then m is the number of blocks, okay? So you put the data, you can cut them into, into pieces. You apply a function to each piece, okay? So for example, I have this function h. So I apply this function to a piece of size Rn and I divide by something, okay? Divide by the sequence that appears in the, in the limit theorem. There is some specific thing that you have to do here is that the function h a priori is defined on Rz. Uh, here, the function h is applied to a finite vector that I mean, where this block grows with n, but still this is a finite vector. So the meaning here is that you put zeros everywhere else. Okay, so this function, this function does not depend on zeros. Okay, so the, so whenever I apply 
function h to a finite vector, it means that I put zeros to make an infinite vector. Okay? So you have you apply function h to each block and you take the average. Okay? This, will be, this will be the natural thing to do. Okay. And then there is also a version called sliding blocks. Uh, what do I do here? I don't, okay, I still have, okay, I start at any point. I take a block, I apply a function. I move by one, I take a block, I apply a function. So what happens, what happens is that in disjoint blocks, so I have kind of less blocks, but in some sense, I have I keep a lot of independence between blocks. Okay. In case of sliding blocks, I create more blocks. I create more data, but I introduce artificial dependence. Even if the original sequence was was independent, because of sliding blocks, I created dependence. Okay. And what happens in, stat in statistical probability is that you have kind of balance between the data, how, how the, the size of the data and the dependence. Okay? The dependence often deteriorates your estimation. The number of the, the, the bigger data you have, your estimation is better. So you have to kind of somehow balance these, these two things here. And this method, this is not only for, for, for extremes. This, this, this method is kind of applicable to many, many other problems. Okay? So, these are these two types of disjoint blocks and sliding blocks uh, statistics. So there is some unspecified sequence that has to be taken care of later. And well, there are a couple of things uh, under quite general weak dependence conditions because we talk about time series here. Uh, we have central limit theorems. Uh, the point is that the, these central limit theorems do not give you yet the estimates. You have to apply optimization methods to extract these estimates, okay? And the thing is that the, so there, there are some formulas for the limiting variances and in all of the problems that, that, that I was, was able to see was that the sliding blocks have a smaller variance than the disjoint blocks. So having this, more data, but with some artificial dependence helps, okay? And I point, point out a couple of a couple of papers just to indicate that this is work that has been done in the last few years, okay? This is not something that was done 50 years ago. This is ongoing work with, with papers published in, 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 good, in, in, good, uh, in good journals. And I think uh, none though he's in uh, Maguire or in New South Wales, if I'm not mistaken. So this is work which is ongoing with serious, serious, serious publications and uh, I think quite interesting. Now, what I think is important in, in, for this block maxima method is that, is that the variances that show up are completely non-explicit. They're typically some crazy, crazy uh, infinite series but it's not even clear how to how to how to get anything from from this from this infinite series so typically what you what you would do in statistics you would say okay well let's do the sampling methods okay bootstrap uh, okay whatever types of or sampling the thing is that the bootstrap typically doesn't work in case of extremes there are very few results that show that something works most of, I mean, there are, okay, there are very few results. Most of the results are negative, okay? Peter Hall did a paper on bootstrapping the maximum and showed that this doesn't work, okay? So typically the bootstrap, the resembling methods uh, do not work in extremal problems. So whatever you learn, I mean, a lot of things from statistics that you try to mimic, they do not work here, okay? So also the kind of block maxima method is basically restricted to estimation of two parameters and possible multivariate extensions, okay? So the block maxima method is kind of very restrictive. It, it gives you some, some limit theorem that you, you, you really don't know what to do with, okay? And you cannot, you cannot resample, you cannot uh, approximate the limiting variance, okay? So 
there is a different approach, and this is something that I have been working for the last several years. Uh, but we, I think we didn't often print up uh, what's what's going on, explain what's going on. Uh, so this is called peak over threshold method. It's really related to these thresholds that, that I draw uh, on, on the first picture. So you pick a sequence, uh, UN, so this is the threshold. This sequence has must have some properties. Uh, this quantity in the, you know, the last block quantity is related to the expected number of large values in each block. And the assumption means that, well, you have small number of values, large values in each, in, in each block as it should be, okay? And then what you need to do here is to kind of approach things in a completely different way. You have to find a different representation for quantities that, that, you, that you need to study. Because in the extreme value theory, the quantities appear in the limit, whatever is in the limit, especially as exponent is hard to estimate. So let's, let's represent them in a different way. And for example, the external index can be represented in this way. I take the maximum being bigger than the threshold and I divide by this, okay? This is completely not, not, not trivial. And this is not obvious why, why this represents external index. But I can go even further. I have a function h. It's not so visible. I have a function h that acts on infinite sequences. It can be one dimensional, multi dimensional, and so on. This function has to have some properties, and one particular property is that it has to vanish around zero, multivariate zero. Okay? Uh, the funny issue with extremes is that you have, to, you have to be careful about small values. And the basic reason is as follows. If you have a sum of random variables, the sum is big in two basic scenarios. You have few big values, this is what you can, can, can control, or you have, to, uh, you have accumulation of small values. And accumulation of small values is hard to control. Okay? So this vanishing around zero property takes care of small values. Okay? And there is some anti-clustering condition, kind of short memory in extremes, and you define this quantity, which, you call, which we call cluster index. Okay, so what do, what do you do here? You take the function, you apply it to a block that, that expands with n, you divide by the threshold, and then you normalize, okay? So a particular case is extremal index, if you choose a particular function h, uh, but you can extract much, much more from this. And first of all, it is not trivial that this limit exists, uh, and here it's kind of serious functional analysis uh, because this is not weak convergence here because you work with, with the measures, which are infinite measures acting on infinite dimensional spaces, okay? So there is no weak convergence here. There's a back convergence. Uh, so this is quite serious mathematical thing. And in order to kind of approach it, uh, you kind of apply machinery from quite very recent probability theory of regular invariant time series. And there is an object called tail process, which was introduced very, very recently by, by uh, Boyan Basrak and, and Johan Segers. So this is relatively new stuff. And with this new stuff, you can, you can show that this type of object exists. So let's see what, what, what I can get with this object, okay? So, but okay, what, what's important is that for each time series, and this is what, what I did with my, my, my co-author, we can write down explicitly what it is. So I, I give you a function h, I give you a time series, and I can write what it is precisely for each time series. So let's see some examples. So the first, uh, the first uh, extremal index is, is associated with this uh, uh, indicator that, this, that the maximum is bigger than, than one. So one is large value here, okay? Because everything is standardized. Then the cluster size distribution. So this is, uh, you want to know how many, how big are the eyes in, 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 in your clusters? If you, if, if you go back to the picture that I showed before. Another is related to reinsurance problem. So you look how many 
how many obser observations are bigger particular threshold and what is the total reinsurance value. And there is another object which is called too large deviation. Uh, so this classical problem probability theory would have a large deviations for, for, for dependent random variables. And this is something again that, so this particular thing was, 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 uh, um, was studied in quite a recent paper in two recent series of papers in probability theory and related fields. So my point is that these things are quite, quite, quite new. Uh, so they stem from old theory, from old problems, but they are quite, quite, quite new. Okay. So there's a bunch of indices that you can look at. And we construct, again, block sliding and Dijon block estimators. But at this moment, they will give directly the parameters that, we, that you want to estimate without, extra, without using optimization methods. Okay? So the threshold, what is the, and everything stems from different threshold. The threshold here that you use is UN, so different than in the previous case. Again, in the block maximum method, you have some limit theorem and the parameter appears in the limit, you still have to extract it. Here, it appears direct, okay? And you can get much, much more. The idea is the same. You, 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 you take the block, you take the sample, you divide into, into the joint blocks uh, and there's appropriate normalization, which is different than in the previous case. And the same story with the sliding blocks. Uh, I take start starting point, I, I, I keep moving, okay? There has been conjecture for about 20 years that kind of parallels what, what happens for block maxima method, that the sliding blocks estimators are better than disjoint ones, okay? So there were some partial results in 90s by kind of good people like Thailand Singh uh, and, and, and I mean, with papers in analysis of statistics, but they, with these results, you cannot really get anything about these conjectures because the limiting variances were in completely non-explicit form. So you couldn't really, I mean, for some time series, you could calculate things. So we approach this uh, kind of starting with what I would say a seminal paper by two Holgers, Holger Dress, Holger Rutzen, in 2010 in analysis of statistics, where we put some foundations for empirical processes of cluster functions. So it uses quite machinery of empirical processes. And all of the statements that I make here, they, they can be written in the functional version. So there's serious machinery. Uh, I mean, the paper is not non, it's great, but not readable. Okay? So we kind of clean it up. Uh, so the basic statement is that you have a central limit theorem for your disjoint blocks estimators and you have the explicit formula for the limiting variance. As I mentioned, this object can be calculated each time series explicitly, okay? So this is what, what Holgers did. And then the statement is very, very short, but it took us about four years work with my PhD student. And this is in, in mathematics work a couple of years, and this is the final statement, okay? Yeah, but so we, we, the conclusion is that the same limiting results holds for, for, for sliding blocks estimators as for Dijon blocks estimators. And this is kind of series of papers. Uh, there is okay, one paper by Holger Dress and his student in Bernoulli, there's some partial result, uh, still doesn't solve the problem. And then uh, there are a couple of papers with uh, myself and, and, and uh, my, my PhD student that we published recently, and then we did something about resampling. Uh, we, I mean, Karsten Jens from, from Germany. So uh, this is kind of, uh, it looks, I mean, innocent, but I mean, took, took, oops, took us a while. Uh, and so we kind of disproved the conjecture. So we showed comp completely what was what's going on with these estimators. I, I believe there is much, much uh, things that you can extract from this. If you want, if you are interested in estimation of rare events without particular connection to extreme value theory, okay? Uh, yep. Does that mean that X of J, X of J plus 
yeah, so there is some some sort of yeah, yeah, so sorry for uh, so there is some sort of to control weak dependence. So you have past of the time series up to time seven, and then you you have a gap and you start at time twenty five to 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 the future. Uh, there's decay of of correlations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is very similar. So uh, fine, this is similar to fine mixing. Uh, fine mixing is not useful here. Uh, because fine mixing is really based on the covariances and you want to avoid it here because you work with heavy tails okay and also fine mixing uh, because with beta mixing you have a nice uh, so decoupling properties uh, that you can you have your original time series and you can approximate your original time series with independent blocks time series so the time series which is based on independent blocks and you can approximate this in the total variation distance. And once you have independent blocks, so the dependence is inside time blocks, but you have independent blocks. So you end up with, with uh, kind of classical limit theorems for arrays. Okay? So the fine mixing is, okay, okay, in short, this is similar to fine mixing because everything is about controlling dependence, but fine mixing is not useful in this, in this type of problems. Uh, it's kind of too heavy on, on correlations. Uh, so it's really good, 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 good to mention that dependence. What what we know about correlation structures in classical context is not useful here at all. There are examples like Gaussian processes. They can have logarithmic decaying correlations, so they are completely they have no memory, but they have no external dependence at all. Okay, so this notion of dependence coming from quite a statistic. It's not useful at all here. So this is kind of, uh, I mean, one sentence after four or five years, which is always nice. Okay. And then uh, I had a question from some, some people in the, in, the, in the industry, okay, in mathematical industry. Okay, so you have two random variables with the same variances. It doesn't mean that they are close to each other. Okay. So, can you get anything from stochastic properties? So we look at this difference and, okay, the, the, the result is much, much more technical, much, much more involved and uh, kind of, but the point is that with, with Zhao Li Chen, with my postdoc, uh, we were able to get the precise expansion between disjoint and sliding blocks. There is a, I mean, we know what it is precisely, and we know that, I mean, we will have some stochastic object here. We know that this cannot be improved, but it kind of, ex this explains what happens with these, with these, with these, uh, with these estimators. And uh, this is, it should appear soon in analysis of statistics. Okay. Uh, again, I don't, don't want to, want to go into too, too, too many details, but this kind of, this explains stochastically what happens. And I think this is kind of even more important than just having, looking at the, at the, at the variances. Okay. So I have just a few minutes. So let me, so let me recall this, this, this statement and I will go to kind of what happens recently in extreme value theory. So empirical methods do not work well in extremes because you don't have a lot, you don't have enough data. You have to combine, I, 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 maybe you have to, it's a kind of too strong statement, but I think this is a good statement. You have to combine empirical methods with some other structures like regular variation. Regular variation allows you to kind of look, use the data from the middle portion of the distribution and then scale everything, okay? If you use empirical methods, you will have three observations about particular threshold, which will be completely useless, okay? So you cannot do statistics with three observations. So with this in mind, let me do, go to a couple of problems that have been, uh, that people work on very, very recently. And you will see a bunch of, if you forget about extremes, most of these problems look very classical, okay? And there's have been a lot, of the, a lot of work done in the classical statistics and very little in the extremes, okay? So causal inference. So let's say that I have this model, so kind of, basic regression model, and you can ask a couple of, couple of questions. You have multivariate vector. How do large values in, this, in the predictors affect Y, affect moderate values in Y? 
Uh, this is typical thing in climate, because let's say you have ozone concentration, pollution, and so on. And why would be the temperature? The temperature doesn't jump by 50 degrees suddenly. Okay? So you have a lot of large, uh, large values getting going into, into climate model, but the change in temperature is you know, one or two degrees. Okay? Another problem could be how the moderate values give you large values in the, in the output variable. Typical situation would be that X would be a bunch of large companies on the stock market. And even the small movements for these big companies can have quite serious effects on movement or stock movements of, of small companies. So why would be stock price of small, small stocks of small companies? Okay. And then, okay, kind of classical thing would be how large values in X give you large values of Y, okay? And there are no, no good models for here, okay? Everything what has dimension bigger than two in extreme value theory is hard to, hard, to, hard to deal with because you may have a lot of, like, let's say, if you have multivariate normal vector, you can write the correlation matrix, and, you know, put some blocks, sparsity, all of this. You can easily identify the portions that are dependent, portions that are independent. You don't have correlation matrices in next level theory. This is, there are some different objects which are not positively definite, for example. Okay, so you don't have the same the same tools available to 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 deal with. So the classical regression approaches, what, whatever you bring from from old and new may not be the best option here. I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but probably it's not the, the, the best option. And of course, there are things related to the model choice, all of these problems, which, which, which components, components uh, matter. So there are some recent papers on causal inference and the re regression type problems in analysis of statistics, very, very recent. Uh, with little theory, mostly in methodological uh, aspects at this moment just to see that things can work. Uh, graphs and networks. Well, uh, there are a bunch of problems uh, that I've seen very recently that people try to, try to approach. One type of problems is that you have, it's a big social networks, okay? And you have particular node, and there are some easy, easy, easy properties, like, okay, number of connections, okay? Typically, this is heavy tech. You have a lot of millions of people who have zero connections or one connection, and you have a couple of folks who have I mean, million, million links, okay? So the univariate objects are easy to, 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 to measure, I mean, the tail index, all of this, but some joint external behavior, so kind of clusters of nodes that, 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 uh, that have external properties, joint external properties, this is some difficult task because not only multi, this is not only multivariate situation, but also we have geometry of the, of, of the network. Why this is important? Because well, the, 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 if you want to run ad campaign, you don't want to approach the guys with small number of connections. You want to approach the guys with who are in this extreme part, okay? Because they, they propagate. So this is one topic of problems. Uh, and I mean, basically all of the networks that I've seen are heavy tape. They have heavy tape properties. They have external properties. Another thing is propagation of extremes in graphs. So for example, you can imagine that the river, river, river network is kind of a, is, is, is a graph uh, and how, how you know, extremes in one part propagate to extremes in, 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 in another part. Uh, I think, here you really need to use a lot of things from deep, deep mathematics. I mean, okay, theoretical mathematics like combinatorics, serious graph theory. This has, has not been used yet in, in extremes. I mean, people use the terminology graphs, you know, nodes, nodes, vertices, and so on, but there is very little serious graph theory used in to analyze, analyze uh, propagation of extremes. I put a couple of keywords, what people do recently. There has been quite a lot of things done for preferential attachment networks. Uh, what is the question? I understand the question here. Time series is some very 
Well, even okay. So very, 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 very different possibilities. So, uh, so I mean, this one or this one? Okay, okay. So uh, let let's say okay. Basic question. Let's say you have twenty five nodes. Okay, finite, and you want to identify a group of nodes that has the biggest number of of, of that has extremal number of connections. Okay, so let's say you want to say that node number one, five, and seven jointly have large number of connections. Okay, so this is the group of nodes that have kind of dominate the network. Then of course, yeah, sure, yeah, but then of course you want to grow it. Okay, you, you, you want to grow it. Yeah. So the starting point is okay, this is final, but then of course you 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 grow it. Yeah, of course at some point this is this is what 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 you what you what you want to do. So the, the object is to grow, okay, to grow, and then also the extremes grow, so it's kind of but of course you, you want to grow it. Uh, I put a couple of keywords like uh, this, so these type of networks that quite a lot of work has been done. Uh, graphics processes, uh, quite a lot of work done by Svante, Svante Janssen from, from Oxford. So, so this is kind of, I think this is the most serious development is, 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 is done here. Then high dimensionality and extremes. Okay, so the, the thing is, I, I put this question where do the extremes cluster? Probably you know the measure concentration phenomena. Okay? If you have if you have uh, one variable that depends on many variables, this basically becomes constant. Okay, so if you think about high dimensional cube, all of the measure is somewhere in the in the middle. But what you want to infer is what happens in the corners because this is where the extremes are. Okay, almost nothing exists. I don't know even if this is approachable. So whenever I see the paper for, for review, high dimensional and extremes, I'm slightly cautious. And the last thing, machine learning, can it really work for extremes? And I want to make a connection with the talk last week. Jordi mentioned about that machine learning doesn't work well when you have this, this trigger function is very sensitive. So what do I mean here? So the trigger function in extremes is the indicator that you exceed some threshold. Okay, because this is if you are close to the threshold, this is very kind of you jump from zero to one. It means that very likely machine learning techniques, without knowing anything about the model, just you know black box things, probably do not work well. And I did this experiment with one of my students because he he wanted to he came to me. Oh, I want to do machine learning, and I was like, okay, okay. Do the, the 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 very simple model about forecasting of extremes with some some predictors. It was terrible. Just okay. We 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 applied the basic neural network. Without I mean I don't know too much about neural network, so it was like whatever was available to me, it worked terribly. And the, the basic thing is I think that in extremes you really need to combine things with the model structure. You cannot just run the you know, black box. This is. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you very much. I, 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 frankly, I think I think this. Yeah, yeah, I think these graphs is a little bit artificial. It's kind of because okay, the, yeah, the the paper on causal inference where they use this graphs structure. The, the, so okay, they, they put this theory of graph structures in extremes, and they use the Danube data, uh, Danube River data. I think this is a bit artificial. I think that the trees will be more, more, more appropriate because you have well-established connections and you know wh wh where is the direction. So yeah, yeah. This is so. This is a, I mean, the, this particular application of the graphs and the extremes is a bit artificial for for for, for this type of problem. I I agree. Yeah. Address the uh, first
if you have that shape or a mix or non stationary, then do you also have bobo and different shape or something? No. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, uh, then actually the tribute kind of it could all make this like that, but like looking at extremes allows you to turn non stationary. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, this is okay. There is a very recent paper by the Laurence de Han and his students. So Laurence de Han is kind of big, big name in the extreme level theory, precisely about non-stationarity and extremes. Uh, this is what people start to look at. So I think what I've seen at this moment in the in this climate business is that to address this non-stationarity, people assume the following: I have a stationary time series for for kind of part of the block, let's say one month, then I switch the model independently, I put another type series, okay? And then this is something, uh, and they, they do this independently. Uh, I, I know nothing about limit theorems. So I don't think you, 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 you will get Gumbel distribution. Okay, I don't, I don't know what to get. It's actually a part of the station distribution of S Yes, so the, the thing is we don't have good models for this. So, so, uh, so you don't need Gumbel or Freshev uh, distribution to, to, to do some estimation problems, let's say quantize. So there is a method called block block uh, block, block quantiles. And then you can somehow put this 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 non-stationarity, but this is recent, I mean, very recent development and there's very, very little about this. Of course, you can do change in the mean. Change in the mean doesn't affect extremes. Okay, so you can add, you know, let's say, in this block, you can add plus five. It doesn't affect extremes, uh, extremal behavior. Uh, but uh, something more serious, I'm not, I'm not really aware. Of. And I don't think it, anything exists at this moment. Michael, you lost one person. What's the index of the gasoline processing? I mean, it didn't What's the index of The space of functions. That vanish, okay. Lipschitz continuous functions, okay. Lipschitz continuous with respect to the distribution of the tail process. Uh, so it could be indicators as well. And uh, which vanish around zero. And yeah, yeah. And but so there is some, there is the condition on the uh, envelope. On the, so there is some, the class is bounded in the sense on, in, in the envelope. So the class is not very, very, very. Sophisticated at some okay. so there's infinite class, but but uh, there is some bound on the on the so the final the, the finite envelope for the for the class. Thank you. Thank you for coming.